Hello, welcome everyone uh, to uh, the 32nd by now edition of Soup and Science on this uh, really sunny and nice day. Um, my name is Axel Handemir. I'm uh, the Associate Dean Academic for the Faculty of Science, and I'm here to welcome you uh, for uh, Soup and Science today. Um, before we begin, um, I would like to uh, acknowledge that McGill University is on land, uh, which long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst the indigenous people, including the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee uh, nations. We acknowledge and thank the diverse indigenous people whose footsteps have marked this territory on which peoples of the world now gather. And uh, now I would like to um, uh, present our five fantastic speakers uh, we have this morning. So we have uh, in the order of uh, their presentations, we have Professor Jamie Kirkpatrick of the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. And then we'll have Professor Yves Levesque of the Department of Medical Physics, followed by Prof uh, Professor Timothy Merlis uh, of the uh, Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences. And then Professor uh, Jérôme Vetois of the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. And then we also have a student uh, presenter. Um, it will be Hannah Owens, a master's student in the integrated program in neuroscience. And uh, she will be speaking about uh, her outreach work with the group Brain Reach North. Okay, and before we get started, uh, let me maybe just um, add, just in case um, maybe you're, you're new to Soup and Science, following the presentation, students will have the opportunity to answer a skill testing question about each presentation. Uh, the top 10 students who answer the questions correctly in the fastest time will win a prize. And that prize is a $25 credit on your student card uh, towards the purchase of a meal at any on-campus dining uh, location. Um, after that, so after uh, the uh, skill testing question, uh, a moderated question and answer session will occur in the breakout rooms uh, with one speaker and a moderator in each breakout room. Uh, you will be able to choose which room you want to visit and actually uh, you can switch between several rooms if you don't want to stay in just one that's entirely up to you so you can join the break room uh, breakout rooms on your own a few minutes before noon we will return to the main session for some final remarks okay and now we are ready to go so the first speaker will be professor jamie kirkpatrick of the department of earth and planetary sciences Great. Okay, thanks Axel. So I am a geologist and I would like to talk to you today about my research on slow earthquakes. And what I wanted to do to begin with was try and explain what is a slow earthquake because you may have never heard of it before. So for context, um, Earth's tectonic plates move slowly but constantly over the surface of the Earth at velocities of around one centimeter per year, which equates to um, 10 to the minus 10 meters per second, so very slowly. And this map shows um, arrows, which are the velocity vectors. And what I wanted to point out here is that adjacent plates move in different directions. And that means that as they move, they have to try and get past each other and rearrange each other over the surface of the Earth. And although the plate motion velocities are constant, at the boundaries between the plates, where their relative motion is different, then the velocities are not constant and they exhibit a range of complicated behaviors. At some plate boundaries, what we see is that the plates on either side of the boundary may be locked together for a period of time, like what's shown in the video here on the left, um, where the plates still move past each other, but nothing happens. And then all of a sudden they move quickly. And this is an earthquake. And during an earthquake, the rocks on either sides of the boundary might move at a velocity of one meter per second. So 10 to the zero meters per second. Slow earthquakes, excuse me, oh, are like earthquakes, except that they are slower. So slow earthquakes involve slip at around one centimeter per month to one millimeter per second, which is around 10 to the minus nine to 10 to the minus three meters per second. Most slow earthquakes happen deep, deep beneath the surface of the Earth, tens of kilometers beneath the surface on the Earth's major subduction zones. They have magnitudes of around six or seven, so they would cause substantial ground shaking if they slipped as regular earthquakes, but most of the time we can't even tell that these things happen. They're important because they happen in the regions on the plate boundaries next to the places where major earthquakes happen. So I put in here a region in red where the slow earthquakes happen, and here in yellow, where the regular earthquakes happen. And these slow earthquakes happen quite quickly and off, sorry, they happen quite often. And so they constantly push onto the zone where the earthquakes happen. And so we think that there might be 
a reason to think there's a connection between these slow earthquakes and the regular earthquakes that can be so damaging. So if we could understand slow earthquakes better, then they might give us a way to um, understand regular earthquakes better and un understand the hazard associated with regular earthquakes. So my research uses a geological approach to study slow earthquakes. Basically, what I do is go out and find rocks that used to be buried tens of kilometers beneath the Earth's surface where the slow earthquakes happen, but have been brought back up to the surface through a combination of tectonic processes and erosion. And I use field observations to try and figure out what are the rocks that are down there and whether they have a particular rock types or arrangement of rocks that might somehow put on the brakes on slow earthquakes to make them different to regular earthquakes. We collect samples from the field and bring them back to the lab and do um, analytical work to try and understand how the rocks deform. And so this is a scanning electron microscope. And the figure here shows an EBSD, electron backscattered data uh, diffraction, sorry, diffraction data set, which shows how the grains rearrange themselves internally during the deformation caused by these slow earthquakes. And then finally, we bring the samples back and we do um, materials testing in the lab to try and understand how the rocks respond to large stresses so that we can explain why um, the rocks are able to generate these slow earthquakes. And our hope is that if we can inform the basic physics that controls these slow earthquakes, then we can start to predict the relationship between the slow earthquakes and the regular earthquakes. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Jamie, for uh, uh, this interesting talk. And now we move on to our next speaker, which is uh, Professor Yves Levesque of the Department of Medical Physics. All right. Thank you for the invitation today and uh, welcome everybody. I'm uh, very excited to talk to you about my research in medical imaging. So um, here are a few images of people through the years who actually do the work in the lab. So graduate students mainly and some undergraduate uh, visitors. Uh, we're located at the uh, McGill University Health Center. So we're not on campus properly. Our, our work happens in the Cedars Cancer Center at the Royal Victoria Hospital near Vendome uh, Metro. And as uh, our host mentioned I'm a member of the medical physics unit. I'm also an associate professor of physics. So my background is as a physicist. I trained in physics, but then I moved into medical imaging research. And my uh, main work hobby is uh, looking at magnetic resonance imaging, uh, both as a diagnostic tool and as a tool for research. And as you may know already, uh, MRI can be used to, to produce images of all kinds of different fashions uh, of the human body. Uh, it's mainly used to detect abnormalities and to distinguish among them. So to give uh, diagnostic information to physicians who then use that to make uh, clinical decisions, decisions about treatment, et cetera. Um, as, as you can see from, from the image here, we can image the brain easily. Uh, we can image cancer tumors in a functional way. We can, use, uh, we can use MR to show other parts of the body as well, such as the joints, uh, the abdominal um, region. And where I'm most interested in, in using MR is as a, uh, as a research tool and as a diagnostic tool to uh, target cancer. So our lab <clears throat> is interested in a multitude of approaches that can serve uh, different purposes to, uh, to target and, and treat cancer. So MR is used in image guidance of, of cancer treatments. Uh, it's used in treatment delivery, it's used in diagnostic imaging, it's used in what we call treatment planning, so calculations that are made for radiation therapy treatments, and we use MR to assess uh, response in patients who have been treated. So there, there are multiple uh, applications that you see here on this slide, and some of the techniques we're interested in have applications in different areas that you see here. So one of the first projects I want to talk to you about is something that's active in my lab is the use of perfusion MRI to study uh, cancer blood supply. So to develop and evolve cancer and cancer tumors in particular need uh, energy and need oxygen. And that comes to the tumors uh, through the body's regular blood supply. So we study uh, the blood supply of tumors and of nearby uh, normal regions. So in this case, muscle and in the vasculature and we use a passive gadolinium-based contrast agent. So this is a regular clinical contrast agent. But what we add to this are some data analysis techniques to try and pull out more uh, refined information, if you want. So what you see on the right here is a, an illustration of a plot 
of the time courses you might see of the enhancement in the image as the contrast agent arrives and is flushed out of the, of the region. This happens over a time scale of minutes. And so we're able to acquire this kind of data in patients and then uh, pull out the data to, to perform quantitative and other kinds of analyses. So one of the uh, areas we're interested in is in kinetic modeling. So we use compartmental models and differential equations to relate the motion, the, the movement, if you want, of contrast agents from the bloodstream into the extracellular space around the cells and then flushed back out uh, during the washout phase. And we produce these quantitative maps uh, that tell us about the influx and um, an outflow of the contrast agents, as well as the presence of, uh, of the vasculature itself. You see these images are relatively coarse resolution, but the, the contrast in them is quite stark when it comes to comparing uh, tumors to the regular uh, tissue around them. Another approach we take, and this is one where uh, we're much more interested in <clears throat> Excuse me. We're much more interested in uh, the the sort of overall pattern of kinetics rather than the quantitative uh, approach. So we use predefined shapes to pull out their presence uh, in tumors, and this is indicative of uh, uh, or predictive of treatment response. And in another case, we've used sort of entirely blind uh, pattern recognition algorithms to pull out patterns from the data. And as you can see, these these blind pattern recognition approaches or blind source separation approaches can really pull out patterns that look a lot like we are, like what we're able to model using compartmental models. So that's a story kind of around what we do in perfusion uh, MRI. Another area where we are interested in um, development of methods is in using uh, the measurement of magnetic susceptibility measured using MRI and combined with other MRI data to synthesize CT data. Now, why we would we want to synthesize CT data ultimately has to do with the use of the CT information in treatment planning, but our patients have to undergo repeated scans, CT, MRI, et cetera. It's a lot of, uh, a lot of time spent in these scanners. So ultimately, we'd like to be able to be a one-stop shop with MRI. Now, MR has the limitation, if you want, for the perspective of this project, to be sensitive to the presence of mainly water, water molecules or the hydrogen protons attached to the water molecules in tissue. And that means that we don't get the same kind of information as we do from an X-ray CT. Now, it so happens that if we use magnetic susceptibility measurements and some uh, image processing algorithms, we're able to approximate, if you want, uh, the information that comes out of, uh, of CT scans in a good enough way to provide the information for radiation therapy treatment planning. So this is a, a, an interesting application where we can translate information from, uh, from MR into another sphere. And the last project I'd like to mention is probably the most, uh, the youngest project in our lab where we're interested in using MR to map this property of materials and in particular human tissue uh, called relaxation. And the relaxation mapping techniques that we use are sensitive to the oxygenation level in tissue. So earlier on, I mentioned that cancer needed uh, blood supply to develop. It also needs uh, oxygen is also dependent on the oxygen supply and the, uh, the proper supply or lack thereof can really influence how cancer develops. So what we've done uh, and what we are doing, what we're continuing to do is studying the relaxation properties of the various resonances in the NMR spectrum in water fat mixed tissues. And we're seeing variations of the relaxation parameters as a function of the amount of fat in tissue and as uh, oxygenation varies. So these are controlled experiments in phantoms that you see here. So, so uh, experimental materials where we change the oxygenation content and the relaxation properties uh, vary. And we're able to apply this in vivo and, 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 and measure water-based relaxation parameter, uh, parameters on the right and, and fat-based relaxation parameters on the right. And our goal is to, to turn this into a volumetric approach where we'd be sensitive to tissue uh, oxygenation. So here's a bit of a, uh, a quick summary of what I talked about uh, already. I do some teaching as well in some graduate courses, and it's, uh, it's a lot of physics and math applied to biomedical uh, questions. So I, I look forward to, uh, to conversing more about this. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Eve. Um, our next speaker will be Professor uh, Timothy Merlis of the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences.
Great, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm in the Atmospheric and Oceanic Science Department, and this is a department where there's a lot of research activities going on in the area of climate change, including both atmosphere, ocean, and also sea ice. I want to share with you some research about hurricanes and climate change. This shows Hurricane Ida viewed from space, from the International Space Station. You can see the eye of the storm and a big cloud deck surrounding it. This made landfall about a month ago, and the panel on the right is showing a map of precipitation over two days uh, centered on the New York City region. And the purple color is a contour of 20 centimeters of precipitation. And there was a one hour period with more than 10 centimeters of precipitation in New York City. Um, so while hurricanes are beautiful when viewed from space at cloud top, they can also lead to devastating human impacts. And there were tragic uh, loss of life in New York City as a result of this extreme rainfall. Okay, so what gives rise to the rain and the hurricane and how might that change as a consequence of anthropogenic warming? On the left hand side, we have a schematic diagram showing the circulation of a tropical cyclone. So now we're averaging about the center of the storm on the left edge of the plot. That's the eye of the hurricane, the quiet region. And we have inflowing air that rises and cools. And as it rises and cools, that leads to the condensation of water vapor. So there's rain in the eye wall of the hurricane. Under global warming, the humidity in the atmosphere, the amount of water vapor, will increase as a consequence of basic thermodynamics. This plot on the right hand side is just showing how the warmer the temperature, the more water vapor can be held in the atmosphere. So uh, from basic physical principles, we expect there to be more rainfall, more extreme rainfall in hurricanes under climate change scenarios. Um, that's sort of a high, high level theoretical description. The nitty gritty may be different. And in order to get at those details, we do numerical simulations. And one technique that uh, I've been a pioneer in is to do idealized simulation of hurricanes. So this sketch on the left is showing a hurricane world where instead of having a warm tropics and a cold polar region, we make the surface temperature of the planet everywhere the same. So that lets us simulate a lot of tropical cyclones or hurricanes and um, including in some unusual regions like nearer to the pole. Recently with Han Zeptecki, who is a undergraduate, uh, recent graduate from McGill University, who was supported by an undergraduate research student award, we've done research where we take simulations of these hurricane worlds and we warm them up. So the top title here is showing the temperature of the different simulations. And then we composite the rainfall of the simulated hurricanes. And what you can see is there's more and more rainfall as we warm the climate in these very simple worlds where we can get lots and lots of hurricanes. So uh, in short, we have observation of extreme rainfall uh, in the current climate. We have theory that tells us that we expect more, rain, more extreme rainfall under warming scenarios, and we have simulation, all of which point in that same direction. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Timothy. And uh, now our next speaker will be Professor Jérôme Betois of the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, all right. Oh. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jean Betois. I am an associate professor at the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. And my work is in the fields of partial differential equations and geometric analysis. I would like to use these three minutes to briefly show you the kind of objects and problems I am interested in. The main objects I work with include the curves, which are objects of dimension one, such as, for example, a circle. 
The surfaces, which are objects of dimension two, such as, for example, a sphere or a torus, which is the surface on the right, looking like a donut. This also includes similar objects of dimension three, dimension four, etc. In fact, I am more specialized in these objects of higher dimensions, but unfortunately, these cannot be represented. A famous example of an object of dimension four is the curved spacetime in general relativity. Let me also say that all the objects that I consider are equipped with notions of lengths, volumes, areas, angles, and curvatures. Let's speak a little about curvature. This is a complex notion, especially for objects of high dimension. In fact, there are many concepts of curvatures, scalar curvature, mean curvature, sectional curvature, etc. The higher is the dimension of the object, the more difficult is the notion of curvature. For example, the curvature of a surface is of course more complex than the curvature of a curve. You can see on the screen, Three examples for one type of curvature, which is the scalar curvature of surfaces. On the left, there's an example of a surface with negative curvature. In the middle, a cylinder, which is in fact a surface with zero curvature. And on the right, a sphere, which is a surface with positive curvature. This is just some examples. But the next question is, what do we do with these objects? What are we looking for? To give you an idea, here is an example of a seminal problem in the field, the Yamabe problem. It was formulated by the Japanese mathematician Hideiko Yamabe in 1960. In fact, Yamabe attempted to solve his own problem, but he made a mistake. It took more than 20 years to fix this mistake and get a complete solution. Here is the problem. Given a closed surface of any dimension, can we always deform it into a surface that has constant scalar curvature, like, for example, the, the sphere? So imagine that you have a piece of plasticine that you want to deform into another surface that has constant curvature. But the difficulty is that not all deformations are allowed. The deformations need to preserve the angles, like the example you can see on the screen. This is actually quite tough, especially in high dimensions. This problem has been solved, but believe me, there are many new questions that have been raised and are still being investigated in the field, for example, about other types of curvature. But I think I'm running out of time, so we'll keep this for the question period. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Jerome. And uh, finally, we have our student speaker today, uh, so Hannah Owens of the uh, 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 Integrated Program in Neuroscience. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. I'm Hannah. I am a grad student in neuroscience. And I'm here today to tell you about an initiative called Brain Reach North. Um, which is also in collaboration with this initiative called BrainReach. So um, I'm here to introduce you to that today. So um, an overview of what BrainReach is. Um, so we provide a neuroscience education for public schools in Montreal and in uh, remote indigenous communities in Quebec. And that is what is specific to BrainReach North. Um, so BrainReach overall was founded in uh, 2011 by our IPN director back then, uh, who is now currently the Dean of Graduate and Postgraduate Studies. Uh, so since our founding, um, we're now actually managed by IPN students, so other graduate students like me. Um, and we're also co-managed by other students uh, from other universities in Montreal. Um, so overall, the goal of BrainReach um, is really to uh, inspire the love of neuroscience by sharing our enthusiasm with other students. Um, so this book, uh, the scope of our program, so I mentioned that BrainReach is involved in uh, elementary schools and high schools in Montreal, um, but BrainReach North specifically um, is looking to uh, supplement the public education program uh, in a wide a range of grades here, two to 10, um, specifically uh, in remote indigenous communities in Quebec. Uh, so what we do is that we develop these online modules with instructional videos for the teachers already present in those communities. Um, and we use that uh, so that they can supplement their classroom teaching. Uh, we also organize some outreach trips uh, to these schools um, to kind of build those connections. 
Uh, outside of that, we also participate in other uh, like one-time public uh, events, science communication, to engage uh, as many students as possible. Uh, so I've got here an example of some of uh, the lessons that we have uh, to for the children. So we have different ages and obviously like a different uh, level, perhaps, in language uh, that we use. But um, it's a nice way to introduce questions like, what is the brain? What is it made of? Um, try to explain our senses, how um, sensory information is processed by the brain, um, concepts like attention, learning, and memory. Um, so what we've done is we've developed these uh, 15 lessons or so here, um, which are activity-based. So they're really trying to engage the students, get them to ask questions. Um, and so we provide all of this information for free online for uh, teachers. Um, and so they can access this and bring it to the classroom. Uh, so we have different instructional videos that we develop and content, and this allows um, people from um, many different places in Quebec to get access to this information. As I mentioned before, too, we have some outreach trips and public events to reach as many students as possible. Uh, so here's an example here of the program scope when we uh, have both BrainReach and BrainReach North. Um, so over the past years, BrainReach has really expanded in terms of the number of volunteers as well as schools, classes, and students that it reaches. Um, so this year, 2021, we have about 130 volunteers across BrainReach and BrainReach North. And uh, collectively, uh, we're reaching about 4,000 students in 200 classes in about 100 schools. Um, so you can see here that uh, Brain Reach Elementary and High School uh, is really distributed across the island of Montreal. And Brain Reach North is reaching all kinds of different communities outside of Montreal in the rest of Quebec. So our volunteer recruitment is on. Uh, so we're looking for volunteers, specifically if you're a graduate student in neuroscience. Um, we would love to have you. Um, so feel free to check out our website. Um, and you can also uh, speak to me later in the breakout room about how to join. Um, if you're afraid of kids, it's okay. Uh, we have um, workshops and training specifically to look at uh, latest teaching methods and classroom management skills. Uh, so thank you. And I hope uh, that you can join us to share your enthusiasm about the brain with our young students.